Hi everyone, this is Casey with Foundation Testing and Consulting. In this video, I'll present an overview of thermal integrity profiling test methods, how it's performed for drilled shafts, discuss how to analyze and report these results, and provide some details associated with what I think are some pretty interesting case histories from our past projects. First, what is thermal integrity profiling? It is a method of drilled shaft integrity verification that involves the measurement of temperatures throughout the shaft during the heat of hydration of the cement paste following concrete placement. When I say drilled shaft integrity verification, we are looking to determine whether there are any anomalies in the shaft. That is, are there any locations where the material characteristics are not consistent with good quality concrete? Such zones could be from washout of cement paste and or fine aggregate that produces a relatively lower strength zone in the shaft. There could also be instances of contamination of the concrete by inclusion of soil or rock particles from the drilled shaft excavation. There also could be locations in the shaft where concrete latents, the creamy portion of the concrete placement that contains no aggregate but develops at the onset of concrete placement in water, that may have not been fully displaced from the shaft during concrete placement. There could also be areas where the shaft diameter is larger or smaller than the nominal diameter or plan diameter of the shaft. Let's take a quick look at a clear case of a drill shaft anomaly where both thermal integrity profiling and CSL testing was performed. This shaft had a 10 foot vertical zone near the middle of the shaft that had complete washout of the cement paste and fine aggregate. You could tell that the remaining coarse aggregate was filled with water as the average temperature in the anomalous portion of the shaft was 70 degrees Fahrenheit which is only about five degrees above ambient groundwater temperature. We also performed CSL testing for this shaft, which clearly identified the washout zone. To me, it was interesting to get the thermal results, but I think the results from the CSL testing were so obvious that thermal testing in this case was really unnecessary. And this particular shaft, the contractor had an issue with the trimmy plugging and they removed the, the trimmy and reinserted it, which uh, was not a good idea. So the takeaway from this example is what a major anomaly in a drill shaft looks like in the thermal data. Now getting back to some of the details associated with this test method, thermal data collection is typically done using sacrificial wires, which are tied to the inside of the reinforcing cage for the shaft prior to concrete placement. These wires have thermistors spaced every 12 inches along the wire. Typically there's one wire for every one foot in shaft diameter. So an eight foot diameter shaft would have eight wires. These wires are tied to the inside of the shaft reinforcing cage and connected to data collection boxes at the top of the shaft. There is the option to do such testing using probes in pre-installed access tubes that are usually used later for CSL testing of the shaft, but this uh, thermal test method is rather labor intensive. Most of our data collection boxes are cloud enabled, so if there's internet coverage at the project site, we're typically able to retrieve data over the internet in near real time. And this is done without having to send someone to the site. If there is no service or we're using the original generation of data collection boxes, the thermal data must be manually downloaded from the collection boxes. The data collection units can be programmed to take readings at various time intervals, but a 15 minute recording interval is standard. For the wired thermal method, the goal is to collect temperature data from the time of initial concrete placement for the shaft until the time of peak temperature development. The time to peak temperature is a function of the shaft diameter, surrounding soil and rock conditions, groundwater conditions, and concrete mix design. Generally, this peak temperature will occur between 12 to 40 hours following shaft placement. So next, how is thermal testing data analyzed and reported? Quite simply, we're looking for sharp, localized decreases in concrete temperature, just as we saw in the previous example. Now, before I get into more of my past project results for thermal testing, I thought it'd be a good idea to discuss what I consider to be the significant issues with relying on thermal integrity testing for assessing the quality of concrete in a drilled shaft. So what I consider to be the main problems of thermal integrity profile testing is as follows. First, there are several non-concrete related factors that can cause an apparent relative decrease in shaft temperatures at a given location. Therefore, any reduction in measured shaft temperatures may have nothing to do with variations in concrete quality in the shaft. Two, there are no industry-wide accepted standards on how to identify a drill shaft anomaly. Three, there's a tendency for many testing practitioners and reviewers to have unrealistic expectations about the accuracy and resolution of the thermal test method. This is what I call false accuracy. Many practitioners equate a localized temperature drop with a reduction in shaft diameter. In my opinion, this is an overly simplistic approach because there are many things that can affect shaft temperature. 
Also, if a true anomaly exists in a shaft, it's typically a zone of lower quality concrete and not a decrease in the nominal diameter of the shaft. I've seen many practitioners assign such diameter changes to very small temperature decreases in localized zones. And lastly, most drill shaft anomalies occur in the bottom few feet or top few feet of the shaft. I was co-author of a paper for the GEO3 conference in 2005 that compiled the results of hundreds of prior CSL tests for drilled shafts that showed this was the case. The problem is that the top and bottom few feet of the drilled shaft is where the analysis for thermal testing is the least accurate. This is because of the inherent boundary conditions of either open air or water at the shaft top and usually a rock socket boundary at the base. Now let's get into some more project examples for thermal test results. Here's an example of how another testing company, incorrectly in my opinion, concluded that there was an anomaly in the drill shaft based on their thermal test results. Note that there was no other testing performed for this shaft. Now here's what the temperature versus depth plot looks like. This is what the testing consultant had to say. Based on our review of the data, an anomaly is indicated in a portion of the shaft cross section from approximate elevation 962 to 958 feet. This is basically eight feet from the top of the shaft. Since this decrease occurs in a permanently cased zone of the shaft, the anomaly may be due to latents and or adulterated concrete. They go on to say a second anomaly was observed as a reduction in temperatures in a portion of the shaft cross section near the bottom of the shaft, starting really six feet above the bottom of the shaft. They also uh, assigned a minor cage shift along the length of the shaft. Again, this is a lot of this so-called cage shifting is slacking of the wires and again gets into the false accuracy part of it in my opinion. As I said, I did not agree with their findings. First, what they were calling out as an anomaly at a depth of eight feet below top of shaft looked to me like the influence of variation in ambient ground conditions. Turns out that this shaft was only a few feet away from a major river and this uh, river had a USGS hydrograph that was only about 15 feet away from the drilled shaft. The average river elevation for the day following concrete placement corresponded to an elevation within 18 inches of where this consultant called the anomaly in the drilled shaft. Also, in my opinion, there was no anomaly at the bottom of the shaft. So ultimately, the owner's representative agreed with my assessment and accepted the shaft. So for these reasons, thermal integrity profiling should not be the primary test method for drilled shaft integrity verification, in my opinion. Next is one of the more interesting case histories where both thermal and CSL testing was performed for an eight foot diameter shaft. Let's start with the CSL test results that showed these small anomalies at various depths along the shaft in several of the survey combinations. Looking at the CSL data alone, it was my opinion that the anomalies were minor and concentrated at the outer perimeter of the shaft near the CSL access tubes. One of the more pronounced yet minor anomalies was at a depth of 25 feet below top of shaft. Let's look at the thermal results for this same shaft. We see a small temperature decrease at this same location, but we also see more pronounced temperature decreases at other depths. I then looked at the temperature readings as they progress following the time of initial concrete placement. What we see is that localized temperature drops are more pronounced for the early time readings, say during the first four to six hours. However, by the time we reach our maximum temperature readings at 18 hours following concrete placement, we see that most of these zones disappear. The only notable exception to this was near a depth of 60 feet where the readings for some wires continued to decrease. So reasonably one would expect that this zone would look worse than the zone at 25 feet in the CSL plots, yet there is no CSL anomaly at the depth of 60 feet. Therefore, it was clear to me that the temperature readings at the 60 foot depth were a function of the thermal wires not being maintained in the same relative position along the perimeter of the shaft. That is, it was apparent that there was extra wire slack in this zone, and some of these wires were slack towards the outside of the shaft, which produced lower temperature readings. As for the other zones that I considered to be minor anomalies, I suggested that the contractor carefully examine their concrete delivery and placement records. What they found out was pretty interesting, that at each of these anomaly locations, there had been a delay in the arrival of the next concrete truck. This allowed some sedimentation to occur at the top face of the concrete, which got pushed to the perimeter of the shaft when concrete placement resumed. But again, the condition of the shaft would have been properly assessed if only CSL testing had been performed. Let's go to the last case history for today's video. This was a project where both CSL and thermal testing was specified for each shaft. I suggested that the owner could save money by just going with CSL testing. However, the owner decided to stick with their full testing program and I'm glad they did. The results turned out to be very interesting. At this site, the rock sockets were within a highly weathered shale formation. 
During shaft construction, the contractor found that repeated rock socket cleanout was needed after material had sloughed off the sidewalls. Then during concrete placement, the contractor found that the volume of concrete placed was over 30% greater than the theoretical volume, which suggested that a portion of the rock socket was larger than the planned diameter. It turns out that the thermal test results clearly showed the portion of the rock socket that was enlarged as a function of the extra material that had sloughed into the excavation prior to cleanout. Such results could have come into play, for example, if there had been an issue at the base of the shaft. The designer might have wanted to consider extra side friction capacity contributed by the enlarged section of the shaft. So in summary, I think thermal integrity profiling has value as a supplemental test in some cases. But if only one non-destructive test method is planned for a drill shaft, it should be CSL testing in my opinion. Supplemental thermal testing could also have value in such cases as the one I just cited, where it'd be important to know if you had an issue with rock socket sloughing and concrete placement overruns. I appreciate your interest in watching this video. If you enjoy this type of content, please be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons. Also, please be sure to leave a comment about what you think about this presentation. Thanks very much.